Hello again and welcome to our second video concerning working lurchers. This one's called Lurcher Fieldcraft and it's a follow on from our first video, Purdy's Progress, which actually covered the first year in the life of a lurcher, uh, the rearing, training and entering of a young dog. This one moves on a season or two and now we see Purdy as an experienced working dog, working on the lamp, working with ferrets uh, and doing a bit of cover work. We also want to go into the preparation of a dog pre-season, um, getting the dog ready for a hard season's work or even in some cases getting the dog ready to run in a field trial. As well as uh, having Purdy on this particular video, we've also got a two um, half-brother and a half-sister of Purdy's, same breeding. Um, one of them's Rob Moore's Outback Rule, won the uh, Cheshire Field Trials in the year 2000. And his full litter sister, Outback Gem, who belongs to us, and she won the competition in 1999. Now since we did Purdy's Progress, we've had a lot of interest from people not only asking how Purdy's doing these days, but also asking more about these Kelpie lurchers. And so what we want to do to begin the actual video is to let you have a look at some of these Kelpies and tell you what really impressed us about the dogs and why we actually decided to breed a lurcher using this particular breed. This is Jed. He's a 10 year old working farm Kelpie. And when you look at him, he's very typical of the dogs in the third world that breed um, without any human influence at all. He's uh, very much a primitive looking dog. You can see he's got a good broad strong head, a very very smooth coat that needs no maintenance whatsoever. He's very powerful and muscular despite being able to survive on uh, a very meagre diet if need be. But this was the thing that really impressed us. Just look at the power and the strength in the feet of a working Kelpie. And now to see a Kelpie at work and this is um, a dog that we actually saw working near Cheltenham in Gloucestershire. He works on a mixed farm, he's the sire to our young Kelpie Wiz and uh, we were very impressed with this dog. Again when you look at him he's, uh, he's very typical of the primitive breeds. If you think of the Spitz breeds, uh, even the wild dingo of Australia, very very similar in stature and physique. He works in a similar way to a Border Collie. He doesn't possess the power of eye of a, a Border Collie, but he's, he's equally as agile. He's probably even tougher, but he's a much steadier character. Now, Steve warns the dogs actually using him here just to uh, move the sheep around this barn. He's looking to see if he's got any use with any foot trouble at the moment. And the dog is uh, he's just moving the sheep around nice and steady, letting Steve have a look at the flock. As you can see from his, his reaction to command, he's very, very responsive to any command given to him. Um, he's a very steady dog by nature, but when he's asked to put pressure on the sheep or put pressure on a, on a stubborn um, bull or something like that, he's certainly got the strength uh, to carry it through. Now these working Kelpies really are an unspoilt breed. At the moment, they're not recognised by the, uh, the British Kennel Club. And from my point of view, I actually think that's a good thing because the dogs that are around are proper working dogs. The bred from workers and the bred to work and no one really cares too much about the colour um, or the actual uh, breed type. As long as the dog is the general appearance of a Kelpie and can do his job, that's all really anyone is concerned about. Now watch here as Steve just asked this dog to apply a little bit of pressure and cut out one of these sheep. So now let's have a look at the other half of Purdy's makeup, because as well as the working Kelpie we also use what we call the groom, the racing whippet or the whippet greyhound. The groom or racing whippet as it's known up here in Yorkshire is a cross between um, the greyhound and the registered um, whippet. It's also said that some 30 to 40 years ago an addition of uh, Staffordshire Bull Terrier blood was actually introduced. And what was produced was a very, very tough, fast, um, durable racing dog. Now these are um, far superior to the, uh, to the Kennel Club ones as far as speed is concerned. I think there's something like 
a quarter to half a second faster over a normal sort of 265 metre course. Uh, and if you think um, that that doesn't sound a lot, let me tell you that a second in Greyhound Racing is something like 12 to 14 yards. So that just gives you an idea how fast these little dogs are. Um, the addition of, um, of Bull Terrier blood, uh, if in fact Bull Terrier blood was used, certainly seems to have fired them up and given them plenty of, uh, plenty of zest. Now these type of dogs are very close uh, to my heart because I was brought up in uh, the town of Mexborough where we used to have a whippet racing track just down the road from me and uh, as a kid I must have seen hundreds and hundreds of these dogs racing. They do make an excellent field dog in their own right but because they are so fast they are prone to injuries um, they're very prone to foot injury if run on bad ground and also they're very very thin coated and are susceptible to bad tears from barbed wire and thorns but um, crossbred with the kelpie it does produce a very very versatile working lurcher as you'll see later on in the film now um, these racing whippets um, do vary somewhat, being a, being a crossbreed they do vary somewhat. We preferred a dog or a bitch of around 21 to 23 inches and weighing something in the region of 30 to 40 pounds in body weight to produce a lurcher. That produces a nice sizeable dog although um, with any crossbreed you do get variations. You can get dogs that have gone more towards a greyhound, you can get some that have gone more towards a whippy. But generally speaking if you use a medium sized um, 21, 22 inch racing whippet mated with an Australian Kelpie then the, the end product will look something like either Gem, Purdy or Rob Moore's Rule. So let's have a look at uh, one of these Yorkshire bred racing whippets and, um, and just have a quick look over one. Well this is a typical example of the breed. Um, you can see the long straight back, very different to the roachy back of the uh, of the pedigree whippet and much more sizable heavily muscled uh, very often pricky had wide set eyes reminiscent of a, a perhaps of a little bit of staffy infusion somewhere and now we're going to have a look at whippets in action Obviously now we want to go out and show you the dogs at work. But just prior to that, what I want to talk about is the pre-season build-up. Because just recently, our dogs have had the longest layoff from work ever. Obviously the foot and mouth crisis meant a total ban on all forms of hunting with dogs. And so most of the uh, working lurchers at this time will be uh, well out of condition. But even in a normal season, when the dog's being laid off for the summer months, it's an unwise move to take any dog straight back into the field and start to work it. So what we normally do is starting um, around sort of uh, August time is to gradually build the dogs up to fitness again. And we normally start with road work. So come the end of July, the beginning of August, this is how we start. And we start with the dogs being walked on a lead on the roads. This way you can keep the dogs, you can gradually build the dog's fitness but you're not taking any risks of the dogs running loose and pulling the muscle before you get them nicely hardened up. Now we begin with two or three miles of road work every day and gradually build it up until we're doing probably five or six miles of road work and then we can move on to other things. But the area where we live it's, it's hilly country and it's ideal conditions to get dogs out like this walking up and down these hills and let them walk themselves reasonably fit before you actually begin to, to do anything else with them. After a couple of weeks of road walking we can just start to uh, upgrade the training a little bit and this is where the mountain bike comes in handy. 
What I normally do is get the dogs out early in the morning before there's much traffic around the lanes and probably have a bike ride of around four or five miles at a much quicker pace. Obviously it depends very much on the area where you live, whether you could actually get away with this. We are fortunate in that we live, we live very close to these quiet country lanes. It's ideal conditions and again by the time the dogs have had a couple of weeks of this they're then beginning to look a little bit more like working lurchers once again. Now the dogs are looking something like fit, we can risk them in an area where they might get a runner tool. This is one of my favourite pastimes with dogs and having a walk in the woods on a day like this is nothing better. There's plenty of scent around to keep the dogs fit. The dogs will probably cover three times as much distance as me. There's plenty of grey squirrels to chase, the odd rabbit, the odd pheasant to flush. So it's, um, it's ideal conditions really. Sometimes on a weekend I could set off on a walk like this in the morning and not appear back home until tea time. But when you think that, um, when you, particularly if you're running a dog in a field trial for example, where the dog has three days of constant work to contend with, you do need to take an exceptionally fit dog. Um, and the dog you see there, the little red bitch Gem, she ran in a field trial and won the competition in Cheshire in 1999 and that actually consisted of a night's lamping over the, a span of four hours. The next morning she was out hair coursing for most of the morning. Then in the afternoon she was hunting cover uh, until dusk fell and then after a couple of hours rest she was back out and she caught 30 rabbits on the lamp in the evening. So you really do need a fit dog to contend with that. Consider when, when you consider after that that she had to do a full day's ferreting as well. So really a walk like this with the dogs hunting freely is uh, the sort of work that you want prior to a competition. Obviously um, keeping well away from uh, from places where there's barbed wire and dangers like that. The last thing if you want if you're getting the dog ready for a competition is to pick up an injury. But this land here is not, uh, it's not bursting with game but there's enough to keep the dogs interested. And these little set aside fields and this bit of woodland is just the sort of land that you want to get dogs fit on. Many years ago we used to race greyhounds and uh, when we did that we used to actually weigh the dogs at the end of training to see whether they were at the peak racing weight. I never do that with the lurchers, I'm uh, so familiar with these dogs I can actually look at them and just tell by the eye whether the dogs are ready for work or not. A good example is when you can see the last two ribs on the dog's rib cage and a nice line down the back of the dog and probably the, the middle three um, the middle three bones of the spine just showing through. That's usually an indication that the dog is getting pretty fit. But he should have a good solid feel to him when he's fit. He should uh, feel nice and solid. He should be well muscled and uh, once you get a dog to that stage then he's certainly up to doing a day's work. You can see these two little kelpie lurchers here using the nose, they just uh, pushed a pheasant just as we came into the field, we didn't quite get him in shot. And so that's it, that's the six week build up to the start of our season and now we've got the dogs in the sort of shape where we can ask them to do probably three or four nights lamping in the same week. Uh, as often happens when you get good lamping weather it all comes at once and uh, if you've only got one dog then of course You've got to get that dog out every time the weather's right. So as we make our way back for home, the thoughts that are going through my mind at this moment in time is the beginning of the season after this long, long layoff due to the foot and mouth. And uh, it'll be a real pleasure to get back seeing the dogs work again. I've got one advantage in that um, I've got a very good working dog in Gem and obviously with Purdy um, having a Gem as a tutor it's obviously a help to bring the dog along. But um, you have to be careful with this, it's okay to work a young dog with an older experienced one for a certain length of time but if you overdo it the youngster can become dependent on the old dog. So you've just got to be a little bit careful with that one. So uh, if you do buy a puppy in to run on with your older dog as she's getting towards the end of the season, just be aware of that. Now I often work the two dogs together ferreting, but very very rarely do I run them together on the lamp. Um, 
I much prefer a dog to work for itself on the lamp. There's less, less chance of injury through collision, but also the dog has got to work for itself. It's got to use its own mouth. It can't rely on the other dog for that. So uh, just a tip there, if you are working a youngster with an older dog, don't allow the old one to do too much for it. Let him show the youngster the ropes to begin with, and then once the youngster's got the uh, grasped the basics of it, then work him on his own. Obviously you'll miss a rabbit or two with a young dog, but unfortunately that's all part of the game. So that's the preparation done. The dog now is fit and ready. Six weeks of work's, uh, of work's gone into the dog, so she's looking more like a working lurcher. She's well muscled up and she's all ready. But before we just actually go hunting, a tip that I'm sure will uh, be of use to you. Many years ago, when I was in the greyhound racing game, I learnt that the majority of foot injury comes from a dog having overlong nails. So I just want to show you on this next clip how to check and deal with that situation. This is Jem just prior to running the 1999 field trial competition and even despite all the work we've had there's a little bit of excess nail there and if you can buy a pair of uh, cheap nail clippers from any of the uh, pet shops around the area and 